Good evening. Uh, welcome to uh, the Zoning Board of Appeals uh, meeting for February 26th, Tuesday, February 26th, 7 p.m. I will call the meeting to order. Uh, I note that we do have a quorum. Um, so first uh, item on the uh, agenda is to approve the minutes of our January 29th meeting. Any comments? Can I have a motion to approve the minutes? I'll move to approve them. Okay. Seconded. Okay. Get the, get the first and the second. All right. All in, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any, any noes? Okay. Approves 6 0. 6, six 0. Is that right? One, two, three. Okay. All right. Uh, next up, we have um, a. Uh, Administrative appeal by Peter and uh, Stephanie Clifford, and I guess I understand that depending upon how the administrative appeal goes, if if that's denied, then we're moving into a variance request uh, under 194-3. Is that? Sure, sure. Well, I just I think it's a question. I think it was much for for Ben. Is I was almost going to ask about the self. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I guess is that. Kind of how you're, yeah, you see I it. Uh, and I don't want to help, but I, I don't think it's a variance appeal. I think it's uh, under 19.43. The way, and it's a little bit confusing. I, uh, it's a, basically a, a review. So yeah. I, you know, the variance standards can be difficult. Okay. Be well, let me do this. Let me tee it up, and then I'll, I'll you sure. can get up there and make your presentation, and yeah. and we'll we'll figure it out. Um, so this is to hear the request of Peter and Stephanie Clifford of 36 Lawson Road, uh, map U8, uh, U8, lot 31, for an administrative appeal based on the Code Enforcement Officer's interpretation of Section 19, Article 4, nonconformance. Uh, Mr. Clifford. Thank you. And just before we move oh. on to the substance, I did just want to say that I know Mr. Clifford from Little League. I've coached Little League with him. I don't think that's a reason that I need to recuse myself. I think I can be fair and impartial, but I we were on the that. same team, or uh, yeah, we, we did coach on the same team. Still on speaking terms. Yes. Okay. I was the first base coach. Okay, <laughs> and I don't, I don't see a problem. Is anybody else on the board? No. Okay. I want to I want to thank everybody uh, for participating and looking at the materials. Um, my name is Peter Clifford. I live at 36 Lawson Road, and. Uh, the administrative appeal, I guess, which is the first issue on the agenda tonight, uh, was just my um, interpretation, I guess. And Ben and I, Ben was awfully nice and spent a morning with me, kind of walking me through how he sees the issues. Um, subsequently to that, um, I have a, 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 an interpretation that I think might be something that's sort of a middle ground interpretation, but I guess I can leave that for later. But just to walk you through the, uh, the administrative appeal, uh, the central issue and the reason I think it's important and is when something that should be brought to the board's attention is that under the ordinance, the zoning board has the power and the responsibility to interpret legal questions that are in the ordinance. And as I noted in my materials, um, the way I read the sections relating to nonconformance, which are 19.4.3, and that applies to nonconformities that are not in the shoreland zone. Um, so it's, it's, the argument's fairly simple, and it's based on some very clear language, at least what I consider to be very clear, in 19.4.3, which is non-shoreland nonconformities, and 19.4.4, which is uh, shoreland zone conformities. And the way I understand it, and, and, and uh, the code enforcement officer, is, can, uh, I'm sure, will chime in and correct me, because I'm sure I will make some mistakes. Um, the idea from the point of view of the town is that the intent of this ordinance, even though arguably the language doesn't support the intent, is that the shoreland overlay district is, is in fact an overlay district, and that you an applicant such as myself has to meet the standards in 1943 and possibly also 
four four if there's an implication of the shoreland zone. In other words, if the nonconformity relates to the 75 foot setback near the shore. And that's academic in this particular case because our house sits way back from, it's on a very narrow lot. Um, it's an old house that was built in 1939. It's about 2,200 square feet. But it, it sits way back. It's much farther than 75 feet from the shore. Uh, just to make sure that we are applying the, that 1944 is even in play, it, it's within the 250 foot setback? Well, it's. Orland? Yes, it, I, it's, it's, so it's, it's less than seven, it's more than, more than 75, 75, less than 250. 250. So it is in the shoreland. Right. And the house does, in fact, have about 68 feet of frontage overlooking the high water mark and, and a little beach that's in front of our house. So um, I'm just going to take a moment, because I think it's this, the heart of the argument is right in the, the language. So if everyone does have a copy, I have one copy here that I will start with. And the starting point is on, on my copy, which is page 33 of the ordinance, section, the very first paragraph of section 1943. And once everybody's there, I'll just kind of recite the good to go language. Okay, everybody good. The following provisions shall govern the use and modification of non-conforming lots, structures and uses in all areas of the town. Here's the critical language that are not located within a shoreland performance overlay district or research protection. So the way I'm reading this, which is also reflected in the heading 1943. Exactly, and that's a point I made in, our, in my letter. Um, so to me, it's clear that I don't fit in the 1943 section. Um, and, and, and that's, as I understand it, the town has said, no, you do have to meet 1943. So it's as simple as that. Um, and this really boils down to 1943 subsection B3, uh, I'm betting, and whether it's applicable here, and the restriction as to whether you can build outside of the building footprint or increase the square footage. Is that why this matters? Uh, well, I was actually focusing on, uh, to the extent 1943 applies, I think the, it, and this is where I think this may even be academic if, if the board decides that I'm wrong on this. 1943 A2A is the, is the pigeonhole that I think applies to our project. And that says... 4-3 or 4-4? Four, four? Well, we're, I think there, a question was raised... So it's, it, uh, the building is what's non-conforming and will create issues for you, not the lot. Right. right. So then it would be under 19... 4-3-B as opposed to A. No, it's in this case, I thought that initially too, and that's why I think I was fooled, and I, don't, I, I think I've, uh, I looked at this carefully before coming over here, and this is a single lot, which is technically a non-conforming lot. What is the non-conformity? The, the non-conformity uh, uh, is that the, uh, right now, it, it, it's very narrow and very thin. And right now, some of our existing building uh, intrudes on the setbacks. So, the so it is a non-conforming structure, not uh, while it may be a non-conforming lot because it doesn't meet frontage requirements or lot size requirements. The issue here is that it's a non-conforming structure in that the structure doesn't meet the setbacks from the lot lines. Well. Again, y both yes to both. It is a non-conforming lot, and that's one of the reasons I thought the section I've just... But you're not looking to change a characteristic of the lot, correct? You're not looking to make a smaller lot or to decrease the frontage or some other way change, impact the non-conformity of the lot. You're looking to impact the non-conformity of the structure. Correct, but, but if you look at the language, and th this is again where the language is not perfect, maybe, is, is, is my way of interpreting it. But it's, and this is why I, I made the same assumption. That, Tell me where to look. Um, right now I'm at 1943A2, single lots. This is page 35, two, small a, where it says single lots. 
a, a single non-conforming lot that is improved with a principal building or structure may continue to be used. Any existing principal or accessory building or structure may be modified, enlarged, or re relocated. And this is where I think this whole discussion tonight might be academic. Because this says to me that as long as we meet, as you can see, I'll let you read it, but uh, even though it does not conform to the setback requirements of the district, provided that such modification, construction, or relocation conforms to the standards except minimum lot size set forth in 1943A1A. And that basically says 20,000 square foot lot with 20% lot coverage and 25 foot front and side setbacks and a 20 foot rear setback. So your lot is a non-conforming lot? Yes, it is. Under which criteria is it? Well, any lot has to be 40,000 square so feet, et cetera. It's yeah, less it's, it is. Uh, it's, um, it's about 0.43 of an acre, and an acre is 40,000. So you're saying that B is a, uh, would be applicable if it was a non-conforming building on a conforming lot, but here we're dealing with a non-conforming lot where the building is also non-conforming, so therefore it's all governed by A. Yes, and, and that seems to permit. If we're under 1943, as supposed to be. Yes, yes. So the alternative argument um, is you, you do turn, and I think somebody anticipated this, if you turn to the shoreland zone, um, 1944, uh, enlargement is governed by section B1, and then A and B are the two um, significant limitations. The, one of the reasons I thought that this matters is that the code enforcement officer instead of the zoning board is empowered under the shoreland zone section to simply grant the permit. And so, as I understand the 1943, the zoning board has to approve expansions of, at, at any level of a non-conforming use. So, um, and again, I didn't write this, I'm just reading it as a person with a vested interest, um, but I'm just trying to follow the rules the way they're set out. In other words, get the uh, approval from the proper body, either us or the code enforcement officer. Right. And, and so uh, we, and so this is really the threshold legal issue. I think, and I, maybe I'm being optimistic, that we've tried very hard to respect our neighbors. One of my neighbors is here, um, uh, Dick uh, Russell, in the back, and I certainly welcome his input. Um, we're trying to minimize um, any problems with our neighbors and we're trying to um, uh, as you can see I think from our proposed sketches really limit um, the footprint ex expansion we're, we're, we've tr really tried to minimize it our hope is to basically go to two uh, you know to expand vertically to the extent we can to up to 35 feet for our existing footprint and we're, we've got a couple little tweaks to it and we actually even take some Aside, so we can get to the, to, I guess, the merits of the project, if the board thinks that it has jurisdiction to review it. So I'm. It seems, and I could be wrong, that both 1943A2 and if you're under 1944, that both of those are left to the code enforcement officer, not to the zoning board. So under neither of them are we the. Yes, uh, that's what I had concluded today. I because the other section I was looking at. Uh, seemed to suggest the zoning board had to approve it, but the section I, I looked at today uh, that I believe does apply would also indicate that it's the code enforcement officer's responsibility, not the zoning board, to approve it, subject to, and these are fairly stringent requirements on lot coverage and setbacks to, to make sure that um, to the extent practical those were, were followed. So I don't know if there are questions, but that's just a simplistic view of the, my argument. The only, the only way that us even reaching a decision here is, it sounds like, is going to be relevant is if you think that the 1944 restrictions are, uh, in this particular instance, going to be uh, more lenient than the 1943 restrictions for you. Well. They may or they may not be, so. They may or may not be. The ordinance is 
fairly confusing, at least I've looked at it a couple times, uh, and maybe we all can agree on that. So, it, it, which is then kind of begs the question, do you want us deciding this appeal, or do you want to withdraw it? Which basically, if you want it, it I mean, <laughs> you tell us. Uh, I, I guess at this point, I, my honest conclusion is that, that the zoning board uh, does not have uh, uh, well, I'll strike that. I guess my conclusion is that either under either scenario, 194, this project is permissible as as in the, a building permit should be issued, and the same is true of the, under the 1943 section I've I've argued for. Well, it, which again, it would depend, and we don't have the actual opinion from the code enforcement officer whether you meet all the other additional requirements. And for example, you could interpret 1944 to not permit a reduction in setback size. And you're in the RA district, so I think it's a 30 foot, not a 25, which is what is shown on your plans. But it's an existing nonconformity. Which would, that would be the case if we're under 1943. And if it's interpreted such that you're, I don't know what the exact project is, but if you're just filling in so you're not um, extending out on any of the, you have an odd shaped lot. If that, as long as you're not extending out towards any of those boundaries, if it's coming under right. 30 feet, it might pose an issue. I'm and again, I, I'm looking at, you know, the uh, the setback that's set forth in 1943 is says 25 feet. So that's that would be if 1943 applied. But if you're arguing 1944, what the setback that will apply is the default setback for the RA district. But the, you know, I guess uh, I, I'm not. I think, let me just double check this because I think the 1944 default mechanism, and I'm looking at under B, B1A, um, and I'm not sure where I see the 30 feet applying under any scenario. Under 196. 1961, um, which is the RA district, it says that in this, I'm not saying that this is what the actual outcome would eventually be, but the minimum setback for a side setback is 30 feet, but then it says it can be reduced in accordance with 1943, but one would argue that that's not applicable if... Yeah. I, I guess my argument would be, since we're in a nonconformity, those sections don't apply because they'd be governed by 194, wouldn't they? Except you cannot make a structure more nonconforming, and I'm, I'm, again, in some ways this is a academic discussion yeah. unless you're actually jutting the building out in a direction that this then becomes a place. Right. Uh, and, and to be totally frank and candid and practical, uh, I just want the project approved. And I don't want to prove any academic points at all. Uh, so I guess whatever argument helps me get the project approved, I'm, I'm comfortable with. Because if, if we go to the 1944 issue, what will probably happen is then, uh, let's say we all say 6-0, 1944 applies. What will happen is the CEO will, will grant your appeal. The CEO will then have to reevaluate the decision under 1944. Otherwise, if we say, if we, if you withdraw the appeal, then the opinion that's already outstanding that 1943 applies is how you would then end up proceeding. So I guess it's yeah. I, I it's suppose your call which one you want governing. I suppose what I'd like to do, if I could, and and maybe. Well, we can get to the merits of this, but a suggestion that I have is that I could consider withdrawing the administrative appeal. I could maybe table it now. Uh, we could uh, go on the assumption that the appeal is tentatively denied. Uh, we could see how this happens, and then uh, I could maybe, in other words, take these out of order. Well, I'd note that I'm just one board member, but I'd grant your appeal. I think you're, you're right on how it applies. So. It wouldn't end up being denied, but well, who knows how the rest of the board feels. Right, and, and I guess the way I look at this, the, the only fly in the ointment is on, on nine, whether 19.6 applies. Um, to me, that's a whole other department because all nonconformity is addressed by 19.4. And, and if it's not in 19.4, it really wouldn't apply. We'd be looking at the default setbacks that are in 19.4.3a, which I think by reference are are implicit in 19.4.4 too. I, I guess maybe the question for the board then is, are, are we going to um, 
uh, if Mr. Clifford wants to, we, I guess, relative to the administrative appeal, do we want him to withdraw it or table it before we proceed to 1943? Well, even if we go to 1943, it's not our decision. It's the code enforcement officer's decision as to whether to permit the project. So even then, we would <coughs> decide uh, the second issue on appeal. Well, as I understand it, and, and maybe the code officer could chime in, but I think the, there was language in 1943 that suggested, and it may not be in the section that I've focused on, which is, again, uh, I'm getting confused here, 1943A2A. That's the one I think applies. But I think that Ben might have been looking at 194. Uh, maybe it, uh, maybe he could speak for himself, but one that seemed to, we both seemed to look at the language that said the zoning board and not the code officer would need to approve at least the concept. Uh, uh, you know. Is that the B3, the reconstruction or replacement section? Um, no, I don't think so because, well, that looks uh, maybe... And normally, when I think reconstruction or replacement, it's more than 50 percent of the... I think it would be enlargement, non-conforming uses, and I think that wouldn't apply. Because yeah, that's a use, not... Yeah. That would be if you're um, engaged in boat building in your... I guess that's the struggle that I'm having, quite frankly, is that if you look at 1943, which mm -hmm. seems to me clearly to apply to your property, there is no section that addresses how to deal with non-conforming structures. Well, except the, the section I just read, which... Which doesn't, really, oh. frankly, to my mind. I mean, that section 2A, single lots, to me, seems to be talking about um, resale of those lots. Uh, but they said... of those lots. Well, it says that a, that a lot that has an existing building may be enlarged. So I think it really clearly does apply to this project. Even though the heading, I agree suggests that it wouldn't, that it would just apply to a vacant lot, but, but it, if you read it closely, it applies to this project. Basically, the second sentence says you can enlarge the structure so long as it meets all the requirements except for the setback requirement. Right. So in a, in a perfect world, I guess to, to crystallize my position a little bit, and I apologize for how confused I am, I would say that this board has the power given Basically, the issue before you is, does 1943 or 1944 apply? The board would be empowered to determine right now that 1943, um, 1943, well, the one I've been arguing for, I can't, uh, I was trying to thought here. 432. I, I'm just one board member, but I think your point, at, at the end of the day, when we're addressing any statutory interpretation, the first question is, is the language plain and unambiguous? In here, I think it's, at least in my opinion, this is plain and unambiguous. The only issue is that um, people might not like the outcome from the plain and unambiguous language, but that's not our role here. Our, the only time that we can deviate from the plain language of the statute is if the outcome it, is absurd, if it results in an absurdity, which is not the case here. I mean, there's an, there can be an argument made that there's a reason 1944 um, is restricted to just the shoreland, doesn't have the additional restrictions of 1943. Perhaps the town council said, if you're already subject to all these additional restrictions in 1944, we're going to let you off the hook on the ones from 1943. It's not our place to uh, sub substitute in what we think is a good idea with what they presumably thought was a good idea. And the town planner's opinion as to what the intent was, that's just her opinion. It doesn't come with any deference. So from my perspective, plain language, it's quite clear. You're in 1944. You're not in 1943. But oh, I'm, I think the opposite. How, how so? <laughs> because 1943 is, are you in the shoreland or out of the shoreland? Yeah. I'm in. in. OK. So it's, Sorry. <laughs> so if I were to withdraw the appeal, the question I have is whether the code officer and the, the board would agree that 1943, the, the one about single lots, I would 43A, 2A. I think we need to have, I mean, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm a little reluctant to be telegraphing 
That issue isn't really what the board's before, ruling is. I mean, isn't, isn't the only issue before the board at this point is whether 1944 or 1943 applies. Right. That's the administrative appeal. Yep. That's and, and so that's what we're hearing. Well, I mean, the board could, this is what I'm saying, and the board could decide upon review that 1943A2A is the applicable section, because that is, I think that would be a finding that is supported by the record and that's been raised by the application. And if that was the case, there would be guidance for the code officer. I think I could live with that because I would know what my requirements are. And I would then not need to go before the zoning board again, and it, it would be consistent with the, the code officer's interpretation, which is that 1943 applies. Do any of them? Can I, can I ask a couple of questions before we go there? Um, what side is your, your nonconformity is with regard to setbacks? Yes. Which setbacks? Side, front, rear? Uh, you, the, it's a very strange lot because we're, it's an older lot, um, and I think I would have everybody go to their packages. And you, there's a there's a diagram of the um, proposal that I can show you. And I'll. This is the chart that I'm looking at. I have an enlargement, but it's. I need my gloves. We, we have it. You, yeah. Is it this? Is it this? In the package. One. Although the coloring is not quite clear, if you could identify where on that structure. Is it this one? Mr. Clever, can you do that from the mic? Because we brought, you're on candid camera, and we oh, want to okay. make sure we can okay, hear fine. you. Okay, fine. The, uh, again, just so people can see in the package, there is a, just to all identify it for the record, there's a chart that says existing house footprint, and then it says proposed addition within setback, 199 square feet, and then lower, there's another chart that says proposed addition outside of setback, 36 square feet. So. The, you can see from this chart that the family room is very close to the, to, to the line. And that's can you reorient me and tell me which way is the ocean, north, south, east, west? The ocean is to the east. Okay. If I have this, yes, I, I do have it Looking correct. Right over the dining room. Yep, so you go this away to the right of the chart. And according to this, we have. Um, use 25 foot setbacks to the right and 25 foot setbacks here this way. So the only place we have a 20 foot setback is uh, you can see uh, to the north side of the property. Yeah, so, so it's, it's a side setback variance, or I'm sorry, rear. So, yeah. It's not a variance, right? This is not so a variance. What's shown in the solid lines is your existing footprint? Yes, the family room exists, and we're, gonna, we're not even tearing that part down. So the front part of the house we are is, is, is older. The, the family room was reconstructed in 2005 and on the existing footprint. It used to be a garage with a, with a, uh, a bedroom on top of it. And we converted the garage into a family room and put two bedrooms over it. Do you know roughly how many square feet that was? Yeah, I think it's about 800 square feet. And, and our materials have, have that laid out. There's actually a chart if, if people are interested. And there's actually, further on in the materials, there's a uh, tax map, which I am showing the board here, which shows tax map 31. You can see how irregular the lot is. And Do you I know whether if you were to get this addition, or I don't even know what to call it, to be honest with you, um, whether you'd be over 30 percent since 2004? Um, no. In, in fact, um, the... It, it's far enough from the ocean that it's outside the 75 feet, so the 30 percent increase doesn't apply? Right. Yeah, that, that's right. Um, but even then, uh, it's, the existing house is about 2,100 uh, square feet. This is all in here. And we're basically going up vertically for part of our second floor. And, and the proposal is to go up to 35 feet to make it uh, roughly 2,900 square feet. So 
So talk to me about what this is. Tell me what this is. Are you tearing down some of what's there and replacing it? Is it just a second floor expansion that's kind of overlaying what's there? What is this? Um, it's, a, it's a complete tear down of the front of the house. Um, there's, there's an appraisal photograph that you can see in your materials. You can see the new addition back here. And I'm, I apologize for not having blow ups. Um, but you can see it, there's a turret. It's a really funky place. We, we really love the house, but it's not functional. And it was built in the depression wasn't the highest quality house and it's there are there are issues with it um, so and you can see that um, it's there's an, it's not a very good use of space there's actually a another shot showing our front of our house you can see a front angle side and it's it is charming and you can see the a-frame here but it's one of the most unique houses I think it was built by somebody without a a carpenter, just somebody that just did it in the height of the depression on a really nice piece of land. And the three lots that are, that are there that you can see they were designed so that all three neighbors could have a waterfront lot. It was very thoughtful, but they just chopped it up in a really weird way. And that's the way people were 70 years ago. Um, so we're trying to be respectful of everybody, but it's an expensive lot. We pay a lot in property taxes and uh, you know, we, we're hoping to add value to, to the, to the so investment. I guess I am struggling with why the 30% limit doesn't apply. Uh, the 30% limit only applies if you're within, it's either 75 or 100 feet of the water line, and this is... Why do you think that? Uh, that's just, a, I think, an, an aspect of... Because um, I'm looking at 1944B1A. B1A, so it has to be, that's applicable for setback from the normal high water line. And the setback from the normal high water line under 196, Nineteen six eleven. Um, the setback from other water bodies under nineteen six eleven is seventy five feet. What age generally? Uh, mine is one roughly ish. So it's uh, this one seventy five for all new. Blah, blah, blah. So assuming the building is 75, over 75 feet from the high water line, then the 30% expansion rule is in a, and he can expand it as much as he wants unless it's restricted by some other aspect of the ordinance, such as lot coverage or moving into the side or rear setbacks that are just generally in place for the district. But so the quirk on this building is that the side setback on one side is already at nine feet, in other words, at six feet technically, and there are these, um, uh, chunks that are not part of the building that kind of turn into fill-in areas where technically because of the fact that the building is within nine feet you can build out to that nine feet mark for the rest of the building unless there's something that keeps you from doing that so if you're under 1943 it has a further restriction that says you're not allowed to further expand it outside of the existing footprint I don't um, but 1944 lacks so what you're saying is 1944 applies B1 applies but not B1A or B uh, it's actually the, the preamble to 1944 that ends up applying. Um, well, it can't just be the preamble. Well, not, I mean, uh, to the extent it is. I'll, I'll, sorry, I don't have it in front of me. Page 40 and 41 in this version. Certainly, B1 would would apply. It. A non-conforming structure may be added to or expanded yes. after attaining a permit from the code enforcement officer, provided right. that such addition or expansion does not increase the non-conformity of the structure. Exactly. And, and is in accord with subparagraphs A and B below. So what then, you're absolutely right, it's B1, and then you have to go to the index of terms, which then discusses, where's the term, there's 
increase, increase in non nonconformity. Yeah, exactly. And Which then defines how you measure an increase in nonconformity. Sorry. And so long as it is a lateral expansion that doesn't increase its uh, the the side setback or the rear setback, it's actually deemed not a um, a increase in nonconformity. So basically, he can take advantage of that for lateral expansion of the building with. But the quirk is that he can basically laterally expand so long as he doesn't get within nine feet of one setback or six feet of the other. I don't know that that's exactly how I'm reading that. But you but can fill. That's fairly academic, though, because we don't have any plans to do that. So uh, uh, we, we, yeah. What, what happens is, to the extent that it, I think, unfortunately, I don't think, I wish this wasn't the case, but I think 1944 applies, and it creates a situation for other people to come in and basically do that once right. we reach the issue. Right. So uh, is any it, other? Is the issue in, in front of us simply whether 1944 and 1943 applies? No, it's actually whether 1944 applies. I'm sorry, 1944 or 43. It's, that's what's before us. Right. So uh, if we just want to decide that issue. And I, and I think that's what we should do. Yeah. All right. I mean, unless Mr. Clifford's going to withdraw it. Yeah. Right. I and, think and that's that, what we're going to do. I mean, it seems like a lot of this discussion is, is kind of, I, I don't know. Getting ahead of ourselves. It, getting ahead of ourselves, informing Mr. Clifford whether <clears throat> right. he wants to or not withdraw this. Well, I, I guess I, I am very tempted to, to, I'm leaning toward withdrawing it beca because of uh, some of the other uh, things I'm uh, th thinking Here. about. Uh, and I guess I'd like to maybe just, in other words, if the board was comfortable with the concept, and on the assumption that the 25-foot setback in the project as it's designed is acceptable as a concept, um, to me, I don't think I need to create new law about 4-4. Uh, uh, I think we need to either, you're either withdrawing it or we're going for it. <laughs> okay, that's, <laughs> that's fair. I think. Uh, so, um, And just so I, I'm just going to think out loud here, if, if we were to find that 44B1 does apply, um, again, the way I look at A, I'm just thinking out loud here, if any portion of the structure does not meet the required setback from the normal high water line of a water body, um, that's, I agree with Mr. Straw, the way I'm reading this, uh, that because we are beyond 75 feet, we do meet the 75 foot setback, the 30% rule does not apply. And similarly with B, uh, that also applies to that section. So given that, I guess I would suggest the way I'm interpreting this, 1944 does apply, it does not require zoning board, it does, does not require zoning board approval at any level and we would be subject to the 25-foot setback, and that's the uh, uh, because 196 does not apply because this is a, a nonconformity governed by 194. So, based on that, and given the procedural issue, I, I am going to persist with the appeal. And unless there's any other questions, I think I'm going to ask. No, I think. That's, that's fine. We'll, we'll rule on, on the administrative appeal. Um, have you, and do you have anything else, I guess, to present um, concerning the administrative appeal? No, I, and I really appreciate the board's attention. I, these were some good questions and uh, thoroughly confused me, so uh, I apologize for uh, being confused. The board has a tendency to ask a lot of questions. <laughs> of I, I, I guess procedurally, I'd like to at least present on the assumption that if the appeal is denied, I don't know if you want to take a vote at this point or go on to the, se the second I think part. that's what we're going to do. Okay. I'll, we're going to do it. Okay. Uh, did you, Dick, did any, you want to say yeah, any, Before he goes away, can I ask kind of a procedural question, too? Of him? Of you. You can try. <laughs> the code enforcement <laughs> officer, maybe. So if we, we hear this appeal, which we are, and we vote yay or nay on it, what happens? If you, you want me to answer that? Sure. I mean, what is the, what is, I mean, you haven't issued a permit in this case, so are we then issuing an order that says, if you, we uphold you, don't issue a permit under this, go to the next appeal? If, if you uphold the appeal, 
then you'll give me direction as to what section to review the permit under. If you deny the appeal, then we will move to the next item on the agenda for you all to vote on his proposed expansion based on 1943B3. Unless we decide that's inapplicable and then we might just deny that also or with instructions to have it reviewed under if we decide this 1943A2 instead. But, but the point being, if we decide that 1944 applies, then there's nothing more for us to rule on because it goes back to the CEO. Yeah. Uh, is that what you said, Ben? I, yes. Okay. And then I think, uh, if I understand it, you, I don't know what, if you would want to give him guidance on how it would be, but uh, that's totally, I don't know whether that's required or not. I don't know. But I, any guidance I could have as we move forward would be helpful because we are hoping to get the concept and get the building permit approved and so on. Okay. Well, again, I, I think that if, if we're going to uphold the appeal, then we need to, we'll need to advise uh, Ben as to what section of 1944 he's, he's going to issue the or evaluate the, the building permit under, and if, of course, it's denied, then, as he said, we'll, we'll punt to, you know, you could then get another crack at the apple under 1943. So, um, I guess with, uh, I guess with that, we'll, we'll close the, the administrative appeal portion um, and uh, just, I guess, Moved. The only thing I could add is there is one section that I, I'm seeing in the, if I'm looking at the rights, uh, under 1944, and it says under four, um, it's relating to enlargement, 1944B1A. There's a section that talks about whenever a new enlarged or replacement foundation is constructed, under a non-conforming structure. The structure and the new foundation must be placed such that the setback requirement is met to the greatest extent as determined by the zoning board. What I would greatly appreciate if you think it's, if it's proper. It's, it's singular, not plural. Um, <laughs> I previously contemplated that as well. It's setback requirement, not requirements, which to me means that the requirement that's being referenced is the setback from the high water body, not other side setbacks. Okay, and my, my humble suggestion was to, to the extent that matters is to say the concept that we've set forth is, seems to be acceptable to the greatest extent practical. Uh, why don't we take a moment to, to, to uh, hear from our CEO around uh, this administrative appeal. Okay. I'll just explain my thought process through this. Uh, you know, basically we have the zoning district of RA and we have an overlay district of the Shoreland zone. Uh, it's a basic tenant of zoning that, you know, both rules apply when, when you have a base zone district and an overlay district. It is, it's a basic, basic concept, common concept of zoning that you apply both standards. And uh, I can understand the ambiguity of, of the way that's worded. And, and basically, the, sh you know, the way Maureen explained that to me was the strong wording of that was to satisfy the DEP that we were going to, that we weren't going to allow nonconformities in the Shoreland zone to simply go under 1943, that they would also have to comply with 1944. And, and I think part of the confusion is when, when this was written by Maureen and the planning board, they were really focused on nonconformance. And they were thinking, where is the nonconformance? And in this case, the nonconformance is in the base zoning district. It is not in the Shoreland zoning district. You say, so the nonconformance is not in the Shoreland zoning district. The nonconformance is in the base zoning district. Um, 
Oh yeah, and I guess I'm not, I, I don't understand the distinction. Me well, either. The, the nonconformance, the, the nonconformance that we're dealing with on this building project is the rear setback. It is, it is a, a base zone, it's an RA district setback. So okay. it's not even in the shoreline zone, this I mean, portion. The, the property is in the shoreline zone. The whole property is encompassed in the shoreline zone. But the nonconformity is not caused by the shoreline. Yeah, it's zone coincidental that it's in the shoreline. It's, zone. it's coincidental that this is in the shoreline zone. The person across the street is not in the shoreline zone. You could have the exact same situation. Um, and so the nonconformity we're dealing with is is the RA nonconformity. Um, that the it is it is not our issue here is not a nonconformity related to the shoreline zone, which is one reason why. You know, the last thing that Peter brought up, well, this says, if I'm non-conforming, I have to come under 1944, you have to come to the ZBA to re replace your foundation. And, and Chris stated, well, that wouldn't, we probably wouldn't interpret it that way because you're not non-conforming here. So we're kind of, you know, tossing the ball back and forth. But uh, I'd also touch on in, in Peter's Can I interrupt you for just one second? Yep. Is what you're saying basically that how you are looking at it is that when the non-conformity is with regard to the base district, that you look at 19.3.3? 4 3. 4 sorry. And when it's with regard to shoreland zoning stuff, you look at 1944. Yes. And if it was with regard Irregardless of where the lot is and what the zoning is, you look at kind of where the requirements are. Yeah, and we and if it and it could be nonconforming with both. If if Peter was within if the same situation happened to be pushed closer to the ocean, we would have to apply both of those standards, the RA standard and the shoreland standard. So I totally agree with that point with that approach. I think it would be a very sensible way to have the code written. The issue is that's not I, I don't see anywhere where it says that in the code. If that was the approach that was in, intended, because we, we don't look at the planning board or uh, Maureen's opinion, it matters what the town council intended, even though they, the other two groups played a role. Mm -hmm. The in, title and then the language itself makes clear that this applies to areas that are not located in the shoreland performance overlay district. If the, the scenario that you described, if that was to apply, there would, have, there would not need to be any restriction like that. It would simply say, this applies everywhere. And then it would say, 1944, this further applies for areas that are in the shoreland uh, zone. This is additional restrictions on the shoreland zone, but that's not what it's done. Instead, it, and I, I appreciate that what was originally probably intended may have been to have both apply, but that's not what the language says. It's okay. poorly so, drafted yeah. at best, if that's what it intends to say. What it says is the following provisions shall, shall govern nonconformance within the shoreland performance overlay district. Does that mean within the standards applicable to or within the property that is within the shoreland? Well, I mean, right. and then, 1943, the first sentence is. Right, I mean, it's, it's both in 1944 and 1943. 43 carves out the shoreland performance overlay district from 1943. I mean, it it's, it's kind of appears twice where we're being directed and pushed to 1944. Yeah. And, if I could touch on a few of Peter's points in, in his write-up, uh, he points to case law, and point number one is consistency, where he cites uh, Natal versus Kennebunkport Zoning Board of Appeals. And, it, and that case law says, to determine the purpose of the ordinance provision, the ordinance should be interpreted in harmony with the overall scheme envisioned by the enacted ordinance the drafter would not included a provision that is clearly inconsistent with the rest of the ordinance. This provision, if we, if we chose this interpretation, I mean, it would be clearly inconsistent with the whole scheme of the ordinance and the whole idea that you have base districts and overlay. It would be just completely contradictory. We don't get to that phase, however, unless there is an ambiguity. We, th these, in many ways, these rules begin to apply if there's an ambiguity in the language. The, at least from my perspective, statutory interpretation, the first question is, is, it, is the language plain and unambiguous? And only if there's an ambiguity do we then begin to apply additional rules of statutory interpretation. But the first question is always, is it plain, plain and unambiguous? If so, we only deviate if the outcome is absurd. So, I mean, I, I guess the question then is, is there an ambiguity? I mean, and... Yeah. 
Yeah. I, do, I, 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 what I, is the ambiguity? I do think there's an ambiguity. Uh, and, you know, if, 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 you heard, if, you heard, if you heard Maureen explain it, you'd, you'd understand it a little bit better. But Although that's still her opinion. As I, I, I understand that. I understand that. Oh, yeah, where do you think it is? But it, it's just, it, it, was very, it was very focused on the nonconformance. Where, and it's, where is the nonconformance? Is, is the nonconformance in the shoreland or is the nonconformance in the base zone? And it was just solely focused on that. It wasn't written as, but, but, as a property. It was, and I mean, I 100% I, I hear what you're saying. The issue is the, the ambiguity has to be actually in the, I mean, yeah. you, you can't well, kind of start bringing in, <clears throat> you know, well, outside please. feelings and thoughts or uh, arguments to kind of create an ambiguity. The first thing we do is we look at the language of the statute, and yeah. I'm just well, not seeing it. I mean, I, I actually do think, you know, the, the outcome would be absurd if it's decided in his favor, because I, I think to say that, to say that 90% of the town has to comply with 19.43, but if you happen to be along the ocean, you get off scot-free. You could do... You How are you getting off scot-free, though? Well, it, What's the difference? In, well, I mean, well, isn't the difference... In the case, in the case of Mr. Clifford, he, he is very conforming based on shoreland. I mean, he's, he's got tons of room to ex expand towards the ocean if it wasn't for the base zone setbacks. I mean, he, he could literally... He's not asking to. He's, he's asking to do a very reasonable expansion, but you have to look at this in the context of a town-wide decision. Um, he, he could literally expand his house 100%. He could double or triple the size of his house and you know, square off his lines six feet up to his neighbors all around, which is completely contrary to, to how the ordinance is written and would have absurd results in the Shoreland Zone. The counter argument would be that it's uh, not absurd because it's a trade-off that has been made because of the fact that people in the shoreland zone are otherwise restricted in what they're allowed to do with their land. And I'm not saying that that's what it is, but if I imagine, okay, if we said 1943 applied instead of 1944 and whoever was in front of us, perhaps it wasn't Mr. Clifford, appealed it up to a court, if a court applied standard rules of statutory interpretation, are they going to deem this an absurdity? And I, I, I agree that two people are being treated somewhat differently, the person that's in the shoreland zone versus the person across the street. But the difference is that the person in the shoreland zone is subject to further additional restrictions, and it would not be deemed absurd because of the fact that those additional restrictions are such that there's a balancing that's occurred. But to justify it, so. in, in fact, there aren't additional restrictions. Can you point to one additional restriction on Mr. Clifford? He can't build within 75 feet of the water on his lot. Where, and otherwise, it would only be a 30-foot setback that's, for everyone else in the, that's in the area. That's 95 feet away from his house. So he'd be restricted from building 95 feet forward. I don't think that's a restriction. I, I assume Mr. Clifford would be more than happy to build within uh, 45 feet of the water if he was permitted to. But. Yeah. I mean, it, <laughs> if, if, you're, if you're not non-conforming, if, if you're not within 75, then you don't have a further restriction. Except for the fact that you cannot become a more non-conforming than you already are. Right. Which, which means you could build up to six feet of his property lines. Correct. In this instance, the fill-in aspect. Yeah. On all sides or just on the sides where he already has six? Well, yeah, it would be six on that side, nine on the other side, 18 on the front, which, which would, which would culminate in a, in a huge expansion of his house, which nobody else in town would be able to do. It's a quirk of his particular lot and the fact that he does have those corners very close. Well, but then he'd also be restricted by overall lot coverage and everything else. He couldn't exceed that. Yeah. But prospectively, again, it's, it's other lots that are in the Shoreland District that, you know, have the same characteristic as this house. So the, the only way that we can ever, in my opinion, deviate when the language is clear is if it does result in an absurd result. So your argument is that it is an absurd result because of the fact that it would permit him to build far beyond what other people 
right across the street are permitted to build in the married zone. In the rest of town, what standards do you apply to expansion of existing structures? Of, of non-conforming structures? Mm. It, well, you can't, you, you can't expand outside of the, the setbacks set forth in 1943A2. Those, that says you can, 1943A2 says you can expand your house as long as can you I meet. Can say it again, 1943A2? 1943A2 says you, so, so that's the one that Mr. Clifford says, was pointing us to. Yeah, and, and Mr. Clifford would not want that section to apply to him because which, his expansion wouldn't work. Which, uh, if that was what applied, which is what, what will apply to the neighbors, um, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what I'm saying is you, I can permit expansions within the building envelope set forth in this, this table in 1943A gives a table and says the code enforcement officer can permit expansions that meet the setbacks in that table. So that's what, that's what I can permit. If people want to expand outside of that table, they come here under the next section of 1943. And we're going into hypotheticals, but it seems like what he would want to do is also permitted uh, to expand all the way out to that six feet, even under 1943A2, because of the fact that it's not decreasing uh, it's not increasing the or decreasing the level of setback if you're doing fill in. Yes. It, it, yes, he, it's, he, it's can, he can come here to the board and ask to fill those areas toward the setback. But it doesn't even require board approval for 1943A2A either. It, well, A2A kicks you back to this table and said you says you can only expand the uh, a two a it says uh, with the setbacks but he's already at that six foot setback so if he's filling in he's actually not altering his setback so he could fill in all the way anyway uh, no but it, isn't it, doesn't a this table isn't that for vacant non-conforming lots or am I missing something two a says apply it also to develop lots yeah. as well two if you're two a says that it can be modified and enlarged if it conforms to the standards set forth in 1943A1A above. And A1A is that chart. With the 20, 25, 15, 10 different setbacks right. for the different districts. Right. But our definitions of an increase in nonconformity say that um, if you're in effect uh, Included in this allowance are expansions which infill irregularly shaped structures. So if he's infilling, that would still be permitted, and he wouldn't even have to come to us to do that under 1943A2A. I don't think that's correct. It, uh, it, well, obviously, that's not the actual issue in front of us. Says, going way down the rabbit's hole here. It, it, sa it, it, says, it says in the, the last sentence uh, under 2A, Mm -hmm. It says you can do that, uh, building your structure. There's no reference to the defined term increase in non provided, provided that such modification, construction, relocation conforms to the standards except minimum lot size set forth in 1943A1A above. That says it provided it conforms to the setbacks in that chart. In, in determining whether something meets the setbacks, though, we look to the definition as to whether it's resulting in an increase. No, there's no use no. of that defined term, so I wouldn't go to that right. definition. No. It, it simply says it can be done if you meet, if you, if you comply with the chart, you can do it. Uh, I mean, it, we'd be going in crazy circles if you remanded it back to me based on that because there's absolutely no way I can permit it outside of the standards in that chart. There's nothing that says there's nothing that says it can happen if you're not increasing nonconformity. It says you can do it if you meet the standards above, which is that chart. Um, and and I do think it's absurd to say to. to See, uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna agree with you and withdraw my prior opinion because you're saying that the modification, the construct or the construction conforms. 
with the standards. So the modification itself has to meet the yeah. standards. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Understood. Sorry for taking us down that path. And 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 I do and you know I do think it would be an absurd decision. I mean, we, we have past precedent that these things have been sent to the board, and to all of a sudden make a decision that we're going to exempt everyone in the Shoreland Zone from these standards. And, and just to touch on that, um, I, uh, Ms. Mr. Clifford also stated in his write-up that my interpretation is totally inconsistent with the past practice of CEO Bruce Smith. And, and, and that is not the case. If uh, this, this document, which I have 10 copies of, if I want to pass any down. Uh, Peter, if you want one, you can have one. Uh, this, uh, this, this document is in, this document is in the Clifford property file. The prior owner of the Clifford property in 2001 was planning to do an expansion. Uh, this document was written by the architect to summarize a meeting that they had with Bruce. So, so this, is, this is the residence that we're hearing tonight. This is the same property we're hearing tonight. And this is the architect summarizing the conversation with Bruce. And you see at the bottom it says, Bruce stated that though this section specifically is titled nonconformance outside of the Shoreland and Resource Protection District, it is the intent of the ordinance that the requirements stated in this section also apply to nonconformities in the Shoreland Zone, which occur beyond 75 feet but within 250. So I'm interpreting this exactly the way Bruce Smith interpreted it. And I do think it would be absurd for us to have a change of course at this point in time and exempt everyone in the Shoreland Zone from these requirements that they've been required to follow for since, I, I, as, as far as I can follow, probably. <laughs> yeah. At the beginning of time. It's <laughs> helpful. So I have a question. <laughs> Assuming. Um, we find some ambiguity, get to where you're at. Does, is this project impacted substantively? Regardless of which, whether it's 1943 or 1944? I, I, I don't think the project is impacted. It, uh, it is, I think it's a relatively modest expansion of the house. I, don't see any neighbors here that are opposed to it. There, there doesn't appear to be a neighbor that could have their view blocked. Um, so I, so I think it, I, I think I think it's a modest expansion that is approvable by the board under 1943 B3. I have one follow-up question. Let's, uh, let's say that the application is approved and the appeal is approved and then new, the house is uh, remodeled and they sell the house and a new owner comes in and wants to do an even larger type of construction. Uh, isn't it possible that we're going to be here again hearing this type of thing or once we decide this is it? Uh, because I'm, I'm not very comfortable with the, yes it was in the file, but we're referring back to a statement to the previous code enforcement officer. Um, what type of weight is that other than it was in the file? Uh, so I, I was, I raised this point is that if we're going to deal with this appeal now, uh, does it cap it once and for all and that's that or we're going to be, have another go on this? It seems to me that if we decide that 1944 applies, we're making a far reaching decision that would impact every property owner in town. If we're making a decision that it's 1943, it doesn't necessarily impact this project from a substantive perspective. And going forward, certainly other a future owner of this property would be in the same situation as any property owner now and as, would be in the same position as Mr. Clifford if they wanted to do expansions in compliance with the chart in 943 
2A1, then they could go to the building inspector and get the code enforcement officer, sorry, and get that building permit. And if they wanted more than that, if they wanted to get the infill permit such that they weren't increasing the nonconformity, they could come to us. I think you are also more or less establishing by denying the appeal, I think you're also essentially affirming that that you look first to the to the regular zoning, um, the base zoning, before you look to whether it be the the uh, shoreland zoning or the resource district. But I think it's you're more or less ascribing to to, to Ben's you know view, viewpoint in that regard. I think that would also be more consistent with a, a general principle of ordinance. Um, construction, which is that where there are two provisions, the more restrictive would apply. I think that certainly, especially in shoreland zoning, it's, it's unusual it. for the less restrictive provisions to apply. I mean, I, I agree with all of that. I mean, I'm, con but I, I'm still hung up on that plain language. Yeah. I hear you. And I mean, I 100% I agree that it was probably not intended that way and that there are some, you know, potentially adverse consequences to the town by not applying the general zoning. But on what basis will, would we be doing that? I mean, what, is it an absurd result? Is it the, the general language, the general intent of the ordinance? I mean, I think this letter, I mean, it's, it's instructive, but it's not, it's not a zoning board, you know, opinion. It's not a, it's not something that the zoning board did. It's just it's not the minutes of some meeting. It's yeah, it's like, you know, some hearsay that what Bruce said at some point back in, you know, two thousand and one. And the only reason I presented that is because it was stated it was it was stated that I was going that I was completely inconsistent with Bruce's opinion. Right. Oh yeah, no, I, and I this was a change of course. Yeah, no, I, so I, I appreciate to demonstrate that I, I appreciate that, but I'm day. yeah, I'm just trying to I don't know how much we can rely on this as a basis for our opinion. It, it, my other concern is if we did go with 1943, that doesn't prohibit someone else from coming in and challenging that with another uh, property. And we say, oh, we're going to apply 1943. That's what we do. They take that to a court. The court then overturns it. And we're, we're back in 1944. I think the better course of action is we just outright say 1944 applies here. And the town really should fix this because this is bad for as it's written, and they should do it immediately rather than permitting it to just kind of linger out there. I think it is confusing and poor drafting. I absolutely agree that if I was looking at this ordinance in these provisions, I would have misread it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think that I can see the point about how someone who is a, looking at this from a planning perspective and an ordinance drafting perspective is looking at it from the grounds that you were talking about that what we're looking at is where the nonconformance is in terms of location from a zoning and districting perspective and that's how this was written now from our perspective if that language was changed slightly to be with instead of within we would have seen it as more ambiguous. But I think that's kind of our common um, difference in terms of statutory interpretation versus a planning yep. background. Okay. For, for what it's worth, I did run this by the town attorney, and he was much more comfortable with my opinion of it than the contrary, for what it's worth. Perfect. <laughs> uh, any other comments around the uh, the board? Any further discussion on the administrative appeal? Okay. Um, then I guess we uh, are we in a position to take a vote on the appeal?
I guess if we're, well, I think in, in doing this, if depending upon what the vote is, if the appeal is approved, slash, I guess it would really be upheld, right? Um, then, I, then I think we're then uh, directing Ben to where, where within 1944 um, he's going to basically um, issue a uh, or, or evaluate whether a building permit uh, would, would be issued under this because 1943 is not going to apply. So I, I, I'm ready for a vote. Yeah, well, <laughs> okay. Um, well, so I guess all, all in favor of, um, of uh, I guess we're, we're, are we upholding the appeal? We Proving would, the appeal? We would uphold the appeal. Well, we have to take the vote to see. How right, I mean, that's, I'm just thinking, yeah, so it would really be all in favor of. Yeah, motion. Oh, it's true. Good point. Thank you. I have a motion to uh, to uphold the appeal uh, by uh, Peter and Stephanie Clifford. I move to deny the appeal of Peter and Stephanie Clifford. Okay. Do I have a second? Second. This is a motion. You're going to, okay. I I seconded it just so it's on the table so we can all vote. Right. Right. So we have, a, we have a motion, we have a second for denying the appeal as presented. And I think what denying the appeal would do would be to say that 1943 three does apply, sorry. Right. So, uh, so uh, it's your motion, but so you move to deny the appeal on the grounds that Section 1943 does apply to this issue. Yes. Okay. Any? Okay. Let's take a vote. All in. All in favor of the motion. Opposed. So the appeal is denied four two. I get the math right. Okay. Okay, so that then brings us uh, back to here. Um, uh, the request of Peter and Stephanie Clifford. Um, we want to do findings of that. Oh. Sorry. No. Nope. <laughs> Rain me in. Uh, do I have the finding of facts? Um, it's a two-page one. Is it two pages? I think that's for the next one. Oh, sorry. Is it? No. No, that's right. Is that for the administrative appeal? Okay, that's, that, is the one, that is the one I have. Oh, we have it. No, this is it. Okay. This is it, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so the finding of facts, administrative appeal for map U8, lot 31, 36 Lawson Road, applicant Peter and Stephanie Clifford. Peter and Stephanie Clifford are owners of record of the property at map U8, lot 31 at 36 Lawson Road. Uh, Peter and Stephanie Clifford met with Benjamin McDougall, code enforcement officer on February 1, 2013. At this meeting, Mr. McDougall informed the Cliffords that the proposed reconstruction and expansion of their house would require zoning board approval based on section 1943B3 of the zoning ordinance. On February 7, 2013, Peter and Stephanie Clifford applied for an administrative appeal because they feel that the code enforcement officer is not interpreting the zoning ordinance properly. Specific, specifically sections 1943 and 1944. 
And um, with that, the, the appeal was denied by a vote of four to two. Um, and so I, with that, I guess the, the appeal is denied. And uh, we'll move on to To hear the, I guess, yeah, I guess so. Now we'd be listening to the, the variance request. So called. So called variance request under 1943. Yes. Okay. I don't think it's a, okay. It's not a variance. I mean, yeah, it's not I, technically so, a variance. So why? What is it? Expansion of non-conforming expansion. structure. Okay, expansion Request. of a non-conforming structure. Thank you. Thank you uh, for <laughs> denying the appeal. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> um, <laughs> not sure, uh, but anyway, I appreciate you. Uh, it was a difficult issue. There were very. It was like being in college or law school because there were so many issues that jumped out. So it was a very difficult issue. I, I appreciate the effort. Um, Getting to a much more concrete um, subject, um, I'm just going to show you what we included uh, as a rough sketch from our architect, Harvey Wells, based in And you have this in your packets, but you can see that the plan, the concept, this is a work in process, but basically our intent is to go up to 35 feet and allow the buildings. Um, there's a sketch. I'll go with the microphone. There is a uh, proposed footprint in the package. Ben and I uh, did seem to agree that it was going to be fairly uh, unintrusive and that the concept seemed reasonable. At least that was my interpretation of our meeting. I'll certainly let him speak for himself. Um, but. Um, as stated, this house was built in 1939. It has a, the pictures are in the record. Uh, it has a very uh, irregular shape, and most of the front part of the house that we are planning on destroying and rebuilding is, uh, is obsolete uh, and uh, has well past its useful age. So are you destroying what's marked the dining room? Just trying to figure out with the coloring and the graying on this diagram, it's kind of difficult to figure out what exactly is being destroyed. But is the dining room being replaced? In the yes, the entire. And again, with respect to this section that you have, this is the front of the house, and uh, with the exception of the back part of the house that's in the plan, the whole front part, which is two thirds of the house, the structure, will be destroyed and rebuilt. So is just the back hall and the family room and the office staying, roughly? The, the, um, the section that you have, this is probably a better view of it, but um, the, the family room is staying, and the two uh, rooms above the family room on the second floor are staying, but the f front of the house, uh, and, and if you look at the photos, you can see the addition. Um, versus the, uh, the front part. So our intent is to basically stay within, there's a couple of additions and a couple of subtractions, but to use the existing footprint and to go up vertically up to 35 feet. And the plans that we've shown show um, that we can actually get a third floor up there. And so that's our intent to stay within the 35 feet that is on the books, um, but to basically stay within uh, except as noted, there's a 200-foot change where we're expanding a little bit on the footprint to get a side porch. And then we actually subtracted some square footage um, uh, to get away from that. So we're certainly not doing the kind of the doomsday scenarios of expanding like that had been uh, part of the hypotheticals during the last segment. How tall is the house currently? Uh, I don't know the, uh, the height of it. Uh, I know the back part of the addition, I think, went up to the full 35 feet, but I'm not 100% sure of that. So I don't think there'll be a dramatic increase in the height. In, in setting aside an inch or two on the edges in a couple random places around the perimeter, 
as a general matter, you're rebuilding in the exact same footprint that it was already in? Yes. For, that's... for the portions that are within the setbacks? Right. And we're doing that, among other things, to keep the cost down. We don't want to build a 5,000 square foot mega house. We want to basically keep a house that's basically a little under 3,000 square feet. Uh, so it's staying in the existing foundation. Uh, it, it, that's right now, the existing foundation is 70 years old. Um, we may do it if it's feasible and it's in the, and the builder and the architect think, think it will work. I guess within the, within the existing footprint, if you Yes, know. yes. Okay. And, and the, the, the setbacks, again, but for, looks like a porch that you're, you're evening out. The setbacks, it, it, again, it's not increasing the existing nonconformity. So yes. You're staying within the setback. It's a vertical only is the primary intent. It, with a couple of artistic changes here and there, it, uh, uh, we are trying to simply go vertically on over the existing footprint. And is, and is there, uh, you've, you've seen, uh, Ben, you've seen the plans around the, um, the height, what have you. I mean, is it, we're saying it. I haven't seen specific plans yet. I, I don't think Peter wanted to make that investment in, until sure. he knew this could be approved. Okay. So I've basically seen the, the pictures, okay. a couple uh, interpretations by Harvey Wells of what the structure would be. And I mean, we, we would review it for, right. for building height purposes. Okay. Yeah. Right. But That's what I was after. Yeah. We have no plans on going higher than 30 feet, 35 feet, rather. Um, the, yeah. That's good. Sorry. <laughs> The new house, it looks like actually is reducing the nonconformity to some extent by deleting this dining room portion that's nine feet and um, nine feet. I don't think that, uh, if I understand this correctly, um, we want to keep the dining room area. Um, there's, uh, so I'm not sure. We have no plans. We, I think we want to go above, but we want to keep that existing part of the footprint. Uh, I think it does intrude on the setback, and that's probably what you're looking at is, is a line going through the dining room. That's just the, yeah. That's just the but that, the dining room gotcha. is, that's the new plan intending to kind of go in that same footprint. I guess what I'm trying to figure out is, is any portion of the new structure closer to the setbacks than 25 feet? No, I think you've zeroed in on the um, the issue. There's a, if you look at the one of the charts has a porch that you can see slightly goes in where, where there is no structure to where the dining room is. There's a proposed porch, and you can see that um, right now that doesn't exist. It's really hard for me to see that. Actually. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, and I apologize for that. I was frankly kind of assuming that the dotted line was stuff that was new. But the dotted, I understand that's, that's not the case. The dotted line is the setback. official setbacks, yeah. So the, the family room that's shown, is that's already been done, and that's not even an issue. That's right. staying put. I got that. So the dining room is the only other real, there's trivial things that go just a little bit over the setback here and there. But the dining room, we're going to keep that footprint and go vertically above it. But you're not going further in. The part that is now 9 feet and 15 feet is existing. Is that correct? Yes, it is. OK. And then where you're infilling a little bit over here on this porch that's adjacent to the living room and dining room, is that where you're talking about that you're kind of creeping outside that 25? Yes. And, and down below, you can see proposed addition within setback. I think it's 193 feet. That's, even, that's just a porch. And we think it's minimally intrusive. And then it says proposed addition outside of setback, 36 square feet. So we've really tried to um, minimize the impacts on our neighbors. And uh, it's also practical. We, we, uh, our kids are getting older. Our oldest is in high school. So we don't want a huge house. <laughs> uh, so it, it appears the, the one section of the plan that is an increase within the setbacks that's not within the existing footprint is that porch on the front. That is correct. And we, the, what's uh, interesting about that is it's pretty much dead space. The, the ocean, um, it looks this way. So the porch will actually, we don't think it'll intrude at all, uh, even though it's technically a little bit over that setback line. It'll be a nice way to enjoy the ocean. It's dead space. It would just be dirt if we didn't do this. And the uh, designer thought that it would be a real minimally intrusive, if, if intrusive at all. 
uh, and would provide us with good, good little area to enjoy the uh, view. And that's not encroaching any further on the setback. It's, it's keeping the straight line. I think it's still 15 feet. Same, same yes, thing. exactly. Essentially an info. Right. Yeah, exactly. We're, we're trying not to go beyond it. So that's really the only reason you need to be here is for that porch piece? Um, uh, I, I'm not uh, sure. Right? Because everything else is within this chart. Um, right? I'll let Ben speak to that. I, I, w I don't know if we both thought that the vertical, going vertically was, could be considered an expansion of the nonconformity or not. Uh, I, I, I believe that to be safe, I wanted to get the blessing of the board so that I think Ben would feel comfortable. And we have, a, I guess, a $5,000 application fee, and we have plans, and we don't want to have a lot of uncertainty. And that's one of the reasons, win, lose, or draw on the administrative appeal, I, I, that didn't matter so much as long as the concept went forward today. So I think the, the key for me is that the definition of increase in nonconformity talks about an increase in the height of the structure, but we touched on well, this. Well, why are we getting, first I want to know why we're getting to the increase of nonconformity. But uh, we have to check to see if there's an increase in nonconformity. Why? Because if there's, the question, you asked the question, does he need, need to even come to us? Right. And he only has to come to us if he's not in compliance with these restrictions. With what are you looking at? Um, because I'm looking at 1943A 2A and then referring back to that chart. So if we're under 1943A and this was the back and forth um, I had with the code enforcement officer a little bit ago, was my understanding, is we're not in 19. You're only in 1943A2 if you're dealing with a situation where the modifications or anything are altering this. And if we're in that area anyway, that it's not in front of the board, it's something for the code enforcement. That's board. what I'm asking. Got it. And so I'm asking how we're outside this chart because it looks to me like as long as you're 25 feet in the RA district, you're in this chart. So the only thing that I can see that's not 25 feet is that little piece of porch and maybe possibly the height, I guess. And then I agree with you. I think we'd go over to the increase in mountain conformity and look at whether it's an infill or not. But I'm just trying to figure out how we get there. So would you call this then a modification of an existing structure? Yes. Or an enlargement. Yes? Are you okay? Yeah. And you guys are touching on... There, there is some awkwardness between 1943A and 1943B. Uh, I've talked to Maureen about this. I've talked to the town attorney about this, and, and, it's, and it's coming to, to straighten out some of the things between A and B. It doesn't, it doesn't affect this project. Those issues between A and B don't affect this project. Where. Where, where I'm looking with this is it says an, a non-conforming stru structure can be reconstructed within one year, and, and this is three, reconstruction or replacement, as long as, the, as long as the building or structure will be located within the original footprint, will but not. Would, why are you looking at three? Joanna saying A, two, A applies, and we don't even go to B, three. Well. And, and that's, he, he is expanding outside of the envelope. For the deck. By virtue of the porch. Well, the porch. But only because of the porch? Uh, no, uh, there's, there's floor area. There's, second, uh, there's a second floor being added outside of the building envelope, which would not comply with 43A. Well, I, I guess the tension is it seems like Four. A, 2A applies, but you could also argue that B, Three applies, and the question is, do we have to analyze it under both or one? And if it's just one, we're we're I'm I'm recommending B three construction replacement. I'm I'm, rec I'm recommending B three. I I don't think it complies with A because of the because of both the porch and the second floor floor area. It's outside of the setback. But, do, but doesn't B three only apply if? Any non-conforming structure which is located close to the required setback from the property line, which is removed or damaged or destroyed. I mean, that's which yeah. new porch would be. That's that's a demolition. Yeah. They're removing. Well, this They're is removing he's, it. He's de demolishing. It sounds like 80 percent of the building. Though. Yeah. So. 
So but this is usually if something burns down, it, you know, it, it, usually these provisions come into effect because something happens, someone sits out there for a long time and then they're to limit your right to rebuild non-conforming structures. And that's not really what we're talking about here. No, I, I see that language used commonly for just demo, demo rebuilds. It, they, they use that language. It, it's used the same way. Uh, well, it's used similarly in, in shoreland zoning. Uh, and, and honestly, I don't know where else we'd go to review this because I don't think it would comply with A. Uh, so I think we need to look at it under B3. I don't, I don't see another way to review it. I guess I had been thinking when we were talking about A earlier that what you were saying was essentially I can approve structures if they come in under A and they comply with the chart. Yeah. If they don't comply with the chart, then they, you have to go to the ZBA, which is what he's doing. And then we have to look at whether it complies with kind of the general land, the slope, and that kind of thing, and whether it meets the definition of an increase in nonconformity or not. Yes. What's attractive to me, and, and I guess I will share, is if the, the language that says to the extent practical uh, will give me as a, as a homeowner here the certainty to build. Whereas I'd hate to ha have Ben and I get into some sort of misunderstanding or confusion about whether the second floor is, was intended under A3, whatever, the, the prior section, under the A section. So in, in, from a certainty standpoint, if this concept was approved and the board felt like we went to the extent practical and, and used that language in its findings, I think Ben and I both would say, okay, we're good to go. The plans that we've been discussing here tonight are approved, and he's covered, and I'm covered. Yeah, if, if, so you sorry. are looking at this three, too? Three also? <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> well, the, the thing that's nice is if, if there's a lot of uncertainty, but if the concept is approved and the zoning board does have the power to do that, that would seem to put every, all the uncertainty in this project to rest, and that's my hope. Um, Because I'd hate to have to really chop a, a section or not do a second floor above the dining room to conform to the A3 section. The, build, the building is expanding in areas that aren't compliant with that chart in A. In which spots? You're talking about the vertical expansion? E e yes. So, e the, the, uh, so there's, is there any lateral expansion outside of the porch or is it all just vertical? There's slight lateral. The, most of the lateral expansion is within, uh, is within the chart of A, except for the porch. The, the, foot, most, the footprint expansion, most of the footprint expansion complies with the chart in A, except for the porch. But we also have to look at the vertical floor area expansion that's occurring over the dining room. Uh, and that, that would be primarily it over, over the dining room, which- And is that expanding beyond is the second floor expanding beyond the footprint? No. Okay. Okay. So, the, so this, the second floor is a straight vertical. Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, and and there's, a, there's a little porch thing on the right. On the porch. Goes over tiny. There's, a, there's a, the porch that we've talked about on the left, and I think if I remember this, there's a little front entrance way just nips it over on the on the other side, uh, on the. So I don't want to shortchanging myself, but our architect said, look, we're trying to really respect these setbacks to the extent we can. Unless I can hear a strong argument otherwise, I kind of, I think this is Joanna's position that A to A is the applicable section here. And if I kind of agree with that, I, I'm not seeing, it, it seems like that is what will apply because it, I, I hear the concern appear, aside from the porch, let's set aside the porch, but aside from the porch, it sounds like the one concern is the vertical uh, increase in non-conformity, is that right? No. I mean, outside of the vertical, there, there's no change in setback, so. Except, okay. Except for the porch. Except for the porch. Okay. Well, we, we, have a, we have a floor, we have a floor area increase outside of the setback. We're not, the, the height of this structure is not non-conforming. 
So as far as I'm concerned, we don't need to talk about height as being part of the nonconformity. So you're looking at the floor area within the, that is closer to the setbacks than permitted in this table is increasing, and that's why you think that uh, 2A is uh, insufficient to get him what he wants, and he then has to turn to B3 to get permission. Correct. And B3 it takes you to the same place as what I was talking about for 2A. It says come to the ZBA, look at the definition of increase in nonconformity. I mean, it's kind of the same thing, except you're outside that table at that point. It would be nicer if this <laughs> section 2A said look at the table, or if you're not <laughs> in that, go to 3. Yes. But, I hear you. So with that explanation in mind, I'm comfortable proceeding under B3. Anyone else for this? I don't know if the board has any other questions for me or if you want to start deliberating. Rick, do you want to say anything? Any other questions for Mr. Clifford? Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions, uh, comments from the public? Okay. And we'll close uh, the, uh, the floor to, and uh, listen to see what, what we all think about this. Anyone have any further comments? The only part that gives me any pause is the porch, but I don't think it's that drastic, so I don't think that's a deal breaker. I just like to hear one more time why we're why we're punting to B three <laughs> as opposed to A two A, if you will, because there's expansion. It is, there's expansion of the structure going on outside of the parameters set in the chart. There's an increase in square footage occurring within 10 feet of one of the setback lines. Correct. Which is not permitted under the table. Okay, and so therefore, to allow them to do it, you've got to go to B3. And the reason he doesn't just automatically get under B3 is because he's violating the restriction of not increasing the number of square feet of floor area. Because he's violating that, he then needs permission from the Zoning Board of Appeals. And, you, and also a slight footprint increase. Yeah. Comments? Ready to take a vote? The motion. I move that the board finds that the um, project contemplated in the we don't have an actual number here. Uh, I'd move that the uh, that the Clifford project be found to be uh, in compliance with the setback requirement to the greatest practical extent, in accordance with the purposes of this ordinance. Specifically, nineteen four three B three. So uh, to rephrase the motion, I move that we find that the Clifford project as contemplated in the materials before us uh, is in compliance with the setback requirements to the greatest practical extent uh, as required by section 19.43B3. Shouldn't, shouldn't the motion just be for approval and then that would be a conclusion? What are we approving? Because it's the request to reconstruct areas. and expand a single family dwelling per section 1943B3 of the zoning ordinance. Right, that's, that's in the finding of facts. We're 
request to reconstruct and expand a single family dwelling for section 1943B3 of the zoning ordinance map. So it's a right. reconstruct and expand. So I'll withdraw my motion. You want to make a new motion? <laughs> Um, I, I will make the motion okay, to please. approve the request to reconstruct and expand a single family dwelling per section 1943B3 of the zoning ordinance at map U8, lot 31, 36 Lawson Road. Second. Okay. All in favor? Any against? Okay, so that's 6 0. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, why don't I read the, uh, we'll do the finding of facts. Um, it's like a bit of a broken record, but this is a request to, recon to reconstruct and expand a single family dwelling per section 1943B3 of the zoning ordinance map uh, at map U8, lot at 31, 36 Lawson Road, applicant Peter and Stephanie Clifford. Peter and Stephanie Clifford are the owners of record of the property at 36 Lawson Road. Uh, additional finding of facts. The Zoning Board of Appeals has considered the size of the lot, the slope of the land, the potential for soil erosion, the location of other structures on the property and on adjacent properties, the location of the septic system, and other on-site soil suitable for septic systems, the impact on views, and the type and amount of vegetation to be removed to accomplish the relocation. The proposed structure will not increase the nonconformity of the existing structure. The proposed structure is in compliance with the setback requirements to the greatest practical extent. Um, are there any other conclusions that we? No? Chris, what's that? I was ready to vote. <laughs> ready to go? Okay. Uh, Building plans. The plans that have been submitted are so sketchy. Well, I have to have to text up and make sure he builds a plan. Do we have any plans? Well, well he, no. The, 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 uh, ben, ben hasn't issued a building permit for this yet because the plans, in fact, haven't been submitted. Um, Mr. Clifford didn't want to go to the expense and trouble of. of Getting official architect drawings without knowing what you know what his parameters were going to be through the ZBA or or through the code enforcement officer. Now he's got that direction, and so now now he, he's got a he's got to do a set of building plans, and 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 Ben has to review those and will. What if we don't like them? <laughs> now there was a, what comes first? The horse, what? The, uh, the, the cart just came first. <laughs> <laughs> it, would be, it would be exceedingly unfair of, fair of us if we were to say, oh, you deviated from what you have here by uh, six inches, um, so we're not going to allow it or something like that. So we, we've basically said if you're building in the envelope that's laid out here, the, the, we found that it doesn't violate the ordinance. It's in compliance with the ordinance. And, and, and now since ben is, you know, it's, Ben's responsibility is to carry out the the uh, direction from the ZBA in this particular case. So we've given him these parameters and it's his job to, to comply. Okay, I'm kind of new on the board. It's basically without an architectural commission, correct? We really are uh, into in, in more legal issues. Yeah, yeah we don't we touch them. We don't touch architectural stuff. Yeah, or, or planting and stuff. Okay. I mean, I make sure it comes out pretty, okay? <laughs> All right, and and uh, okay. So uh, and the vote uh, and the uh, the uh, reconstruction was approved six zero. Just again for the record. Uh, any other business before? We vote up and down on the findings of fact. Uh, I think. Oh, we didn't do that. No. You you posed. Should we any additional findings? Okay. I think we just need the. Okay. John. Do you want to put in that section that applies in the record? Yes. Uh, it was B3, 19.4, B, yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, and you're right, I did pose the question, are there any other additional findings we would like to make or add? And that would be one. Uh, although, I, well, I think that 
that's actually in the finding of fact. So we're, we're so we've approved the request to expand the dwelling per section 1943B3. So okay. so that that's that's okay. Uh, okay, I I think the only other thing I would like to add is that, and it's kind of goes without saying, but I just feel better is that. Um, that the, that, the, that the vertical height of the building will, will not exceed 35 feet, which is code anyway, but, okay. So. Yeah. Build, building height will not exceed 35 feet. Build, building height. Okay. So with that, uh, take a vote on the finding of facts. All in favor? Any opposed? Okay, that's six zero. Okay. Uh, any other business before the board? Okay, so we're in adjournment at 8.47 p.m. Rather quick one for us. <laughs>